Good morning and welcome back to the Senate Legislative Tax Committee. This is the 91st legislative session. We have come back from the interim. We do have a quorum. Uh, no uh, great formalities here, as many of you know. Uh, so we do have a couple new folks, but is Mr. Howe here? He, he is not here yet. We'll introduce him when he comes in. We have one new member to the tax committee, that's Senator John Howe. We lost Eric, uh, Senator Pratt. He, oh, geez. <laughs> Retract, erase, back up. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, Senator Jeff Howe. God help me, Jeff Howe. Um, Senator Jeff Howe is here replacing Senator Eric Pratt. He went over to chair the Jobs Committee, the one that uh, Senator Miller left. Uh, and we have two new pages. Where are you? Behind me. Uh, Max and Paul. Max, raise your hand. And Paul, raise your hand. All right. So that's, that's it. That's the new folks. With that, we're going to just get started. When Senator Howe gets here, we'll have him say hello. So we, the first bill we have up today is Senator Ralph, uh, Senate File 329. It looks like you have former Senator John Peterson with you as well. All right, Senator Ralph, do you have any amendments to yours? Um, I don't believe so, unless there's one that somebody didn't tell me about. <laughs> okay, so no amendments for uh, Senator Ralph. Senator Ralph, you want to give us... Uh, Go ahead and tell us about your bill, what you got. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what this bill is is to uh, begin to roll back a provision that was created uh, back during one of the major budget deficits that accelerated the time when people have to actually pay their sales tax. So they actually estimate it and pay it ahead of time rather than as it's, as it's collected and then submitted. And this... Uh, produces a significant burden on people who have cyclic businesses and who don't necessarily collect the sales tax even though they have to pay it. And what this bill does is starts to carve out a portion of the accelerated sales tax and move it back to where it should be. Um, the bill would um, exempt suppliers of building materials <laughs> from that accelerated sales tax. I have here uh, former Senator John Peterson, who is now uh, uh, works with IMCOM Block, and now it's at Chemstone, isn't it? And, uh, and I believe John can fill us in on a little bit more, first of all, the impact on a business where they actually have to pay this ahead of time and well ahead of time and don't have the revenues coming in to actually cover it. So with that, I'd uh, have John Peterson testify. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It's John Peterson. I'm with uh, the Semstone family of companies that includes Amcon Concrete Products, uh, Semstone, and TCC are the main organization. I appreciate you uh, giving me the time, Mr. Chairman and members, to take a look at this uh, issue that offers, as Senator Ralph said, a significant burden, uh, specifically to building materials companies. Um, I have the privilege of representing uh, over 1,200 uh, workers, uh, the Beckin family, as I said, and the uh, Semstone family of companies. Tom Beckin, uh, his family, uh, represented by Thor and Tim Beckin as well, started in the building materials industry back 91 years ago this year, actually right here in St. Paul, uh, selling uh, building materials and have really become a, a regional uh, uh, organization that works in many different states and, as I said, employs over 1,200 people at this time. What happens to us, as Senator Ralph said, is that we're asked to pay our sales tax early. So to try and create a picture of what happens, um, when that payment comes due. So our, the sales we, have, we make in May, for example, is due on June 20th. We have to pay that sales tax bill. Just eight days later, on, Ju on June 28th, we're asked to pay 81.4%, an estimate of what our sales tax is gonna be in July. It's a significant burden for our organization. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars that we have to pay like I said, just eight days after making our, our sales tax payment for May. And uh, the issue that we're dealing with in construction materials is that we basically have about six or seven months to service our customers 
when our customers are doing the work during the warm weather months that we experience here in the Midwest. And so we extend terms to them, oftentimes 30 days. Um, our collection days push out beyond that, sometimes 45, 60 days, or even on large jobs, it can be up to, to uh, 90 or 120 days before we actually get paid for the material that we supply. In fact, the CFO that I work with um, shared with me just earlier this week that when we make that payment in, at June 20th for the sales tax in May, we typically only have about 50% of those invoices collected. Uh, and that's significantly different than some of the other businesses in Minnesota, um, like retailers or car dealers who collect that sales tax even before the customer leaves their showroom or leaves their store, they would have those funds available to, to make that, uh, that sales tax payment. So if I could take a moment and just draw your attention uh, to the bill that you have in front of you. As you know, the underlying um, statements in the bill are just simply the changes to current law. And so you can see on line 1.14, we're simply just asking to be exempted from uh, current law. And then if you move to the second page, um, the um, Department of Revenue has some codes there for different types of industries. And so these would be the, the five industries that deal with the same uh, issue that we're dealing with. They're basically involved in the construction materials industry that would be uh, allowed or be exempted from this early payment. And again, please, please understand, we're not asking to not pay sales tax. Uh, we want to pay our sales tax on time, just like we do every other month of the year. We're simply just asking you to allow us not to pay that sales tax early and have to go to a bank and borrow that money uh, and pay interest on that money when our season is literally just, just getting started and our cash flow is very, very low. It's a significant burden that I hope uh, we can show you that uh, we should be exempted from uh, moving forward. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Will, for bringing this bill forward. I'm happy to be a, a co-author on it. We have tried over and over again after um, the um, accelerated payment was put into place many years ago uh, to get rid of it for everybody. And um, the, the last time we were able to lower it, which was at 90 percent, um, was in... Uh, in 2014, where we have this, we had a plug number, um, uh, and it went down to 81.4. But um, you know, I'm looking at the revenue estimate, and I think that um, as we're looking at those things that are going to uh, have tails to them, that nevertheless, this one, um, this one is very appealing to me because it picks out and shows, and, and um, Senator Peterson. Um, the impact on uh, a vulnerable industry and a construction, a, a cyclical industry. And if we're going, we can either do one of two things, in my mind. We can either reduce that number again, or we can pay attention to the uh, critical in, uh, industries that it affects. Um, and we're probably going to have other bills <laughs> saying, well, my industry or my business is is just as vulnerable, but you have to start somewhere if you're going to do it that way, and um, uh, I think this is as good as any. Uh, I do have a question, Mr. Chairman, for um, Ms. Pollock uh, with regard to if uh, at this point, I see that um, here we would have um, uh, for 2020, and, and it's, it's also appealing that it's um, it is actually a one-time expenditure with just a small amount of residual, so it's not a big tail. Um, if we did it all at once in terms of, quote, one-time spending or one-time tax relief, do you have um, any notion or is there somebody here from the department who could tell us what that um, big one-time hit would be? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Rust, um, do, you, do you mean for all? Yeah, if you uh, just vendors got rid of it. I, I, do, I do have that number. I would have to just look it up for you from a previous estimate. Okay, and, and uh, we, we do need to remember that as you uh, 
pointed out that um, this was undertaken so that uh, we could uh, solve a budget challenge and uh, get some money into a current fiscal year rather than delaying the payment, which would have ordinarily come in the next month. And, um, uh, and we couldn't, um, we're trying to have a balanced budget as of June 30th. And so that's why that, that, was, uh, that was looked at. But um, it is an issue that we should continue to pay attention to and, and try and uh, 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 as much as anywhere else, um, give um, businesses a little bit of tax relief here. And as you pointed out as well, not getting rid of the obligation, just the timing. That's all it is. It's just a matter of the timing. So thank you again, Senator Ralph. Yeah. Well, just what I was, I was going to kind of echo what Senator Rest said, Mr. Chair, that we're not really, this money isn't disappearing from the budget. It just appears at a later time, which actually, if you've got a, if you've got a, a, a varying budget and the next year the revenues are going down, that's a chunk that shows up that's actually a positive on the, on the revenue forecast. So it, it actually would have the effect uh, in, our, in our current situation kind of spreading things out. I believe um, Ms. Kadoon is uh, also uh, here and would be able to testify if the chair would care to hear from her. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, just let me add my voice to uh, the effort of trying to buy this down. It is, the June Accelerated is a very, very important mechanism, just like the K-12 payment shift is. It's a very, very important trigger to have at the disposal of future legislatures. When economic times turn down and we find ourselves short of money, it is very helpful to have these kind of triggers to be able to apply uh, to bridge a budget shortfall. So as, uh, and I did mention to Senator Gazelle because he starts to think about budget targets, I do think this committee should be considered for some money, because there's going to be a, quite a bit of one-time money available in the February forecast. But I assume that number's not going to change much from what we had in November. There's a good opportunity to try and buy this down some. The rest of the spending committees won't like that, Senator Gazelka. But they will benefit from it two years from now if our GDP growth has fallen off and the tax committee is able to put this trigger back in and essentially create some money by moving payments by a couple days uh, could be very, very helpful to future legislatures. So I just add my voice to it's not very sexy. You don't get much credit for doing it because it doesn't reduce anybody's tax liability. It moves it by a few days, but it can be very helpful to a future legislature. So I want to add my voice to that as we think about uh, how this committee might spend some money. We made a little bit, like as Senator Ress said, Senator Scoy made a little headway on it in uh, 2014, but uh, not enough. So if we could make some more, and you know, it's hundreds of millions of dollars to take it down to zero, but the further we can get it down, uh, I think the, the more we'll benefit from it going forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, to uh, answer Senator Ress's question, I pulled up a revenue estimate from a Senator Ralph bill from 2017. Um, so, of course, these numbers may not be um, accurate at this point. But uh, for the uh, general sales tax, uh, the, the impact to the general fund is about $265 million um, in the first year, and then roughly $9 million um, uh, in the uh, going forward. So, um, again, the current proposal is just a fraction of that um, amount because these would be all vendors who are required to uh, do the June accelerated remittance. Sorry, uh, Two, $265 million, Mr. Chair. That's good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, from Rockville, Minnesota. 
<laughs> Who would be in charge? Who is the group in charge of housebreaking? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy. I'll be happy to work on it with Senator Gazalka. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Beth Cadu, and I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to thank um, Senator Ralph for bringing this bill forward. We're certainly supportive of the bill, and do appreciate um, you looking at it this year. This was actually an accounting shift from 1980s. I think it was 1981. It was put in place. It's one of the very few accounting shifts, if any, that still remain in our state's budget. As our state's budget have improved, we certainly have unwound a lot of these, um, and this one still remains. It does have a cost to the business community. There's an administrative cost for doing so, as was um, you heard in the testimony from um, former Senator Peterson. Um, it impacts tax, my understanding of over about 2,700 businesses in the state that have to collect and remit the sales tax early. Um, as many other states allow, like a vendor compensation allowance, Minnesota does not, so we don't actually recognize the cost for a business community of collecting and remitting the sales tax on behalf of the state. I have heard from businesses, not only in this industry, but others that actually do have a cost for doing this, as was mentioned. Some of them actually have to borrow money um, and then to en enable to pay this tax early. So we support this version of the bill, but as you look at resources, we would certainly encourage you to expand this to other industries as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cadoon. Members, any final questions for Senator Ralph? Okay. Senator Ralph, any final words? Uh, just uh, ask to consider this. Um, and possibly expand it. I, I'm certainly, uh, if we do have resources available, I think uh, this is the time to do it um, and would certainly encourage that further inquiry. Thank you very much, Senator Ralph and former Senator John Peterson. Thank you very much for coming down and, and taking the time to share a few words about this proposal. Thank you very much. With that, uh, Senate file 329 will be held over held over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Okay, next up is Senator Mark Johnson, Senate File 318. Welcome to the committee, Senator Johnson, and guests. Uh, you have Senate File 318. I guess I should have mentioned, members, uh, so this we heard last year, and it was in last year's omnibus bill as well, just for your information. Senator Johnson, uh, tell us about your bill. I, Mr. Chair, I will tell you about the bill again, and we will <laughs> keep bringing it back until we can get this one, this one passed. And we appreciate the committee's support last year. Uh, on this bill, and we didn't have uh, any opposition. This was put into your tax bill and then also over on the House side and ended up in the uh, omnibus bill that eventually met its doom. So uh, appreciate you uh, revetting this bill. Again, it hasn't changed from last year. It's uh, Senate File 318. Uh, you've got it in your packet there. And this is simply uh, an abatement uh, for natural gas infrastructure, trying to get this out to underserved communities. Uh, it, across the state. The reason why we've got that 12-year term is to help uh, to, for the infrastructure to lower the cost, capital cost of that infrastructure so it makes it feasible for these projects to go forward. Uh, you know, I've got one of these smaller projects in my area, a uh, little town called Fertile, and next to it, Beltrami. This is really significantly brings down the cost of heating. When you compare that to something like electric heat, uh, in a house, you know, which can run, you know, from my own experience, we had a $400 electric bill for heating our house in the wintertime. And you compare that with the $100 bill that I'm paying now on these cold, cold days, it's quite a savings, quite a savings for individuals in these small towns that, that uh, you know, can use the savings. So with me today, I have a couple of testifiers that would like to talk a little bit about the bill and some of the benefits that we'd see. That's all right, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. I'm Cody Chilson with Greater Minnesota Gas. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, I do have a handout um, that I believe has a page that's maybe missing from the handouts you've received. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Like I said, my name is Cody Chilson. I'm the operations manager for Greater Minnesota Gas and our sister company, Greater Minnesota Transmission, based out of Lesueur, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Those of you that currently have access to natural gas may not spend a lot of time thinking about the benefits it provides, but a typical residential customer saves between $500 and $1,000 per year once converting to natural gas. Businesses save between 20 and 40% annually and in total, small communities save between a quarter million dollars and a million dollars each year. That's money that can be spent for other purposes, for people to support their families or reinvest in their businesses. I work for a company that focuses on bringing natural gas to rural Minnesota. If you look at the packet provided, you'll see a map that shows that our service territory has expanded significantly in recent years while well, we've done just that. Our projects are very capital intensive and their feasibility <clears throat> is primarily based on population density and the distance from an interstate pipeline. Property taxes for the most part are based on the amount of pipe that is installed and the cost of construction, making taxes higher for newer, longer systems. In many cases, Expanding natural gas service to rural Minnesota is too expensive, and without property tax relief, many communities will never receive natural gas service. However, with property tax relief on the front end of a project, more projects become economically feasible, which will promote development. If you look at the graph in your packet, you'll see that the Average property taxes per customer for Greater Minnesota Gas has increased significantly since 2010. Currently, about 20% of each residential customer's bill goes toward paying property tax. The other thing that this graph tells me is that over time, our company has installed longer projects to less dense areas, and in terms of projects, the low-hanging fruit is gone. I'm here today to urge you to please support this bill so that we can continue to bring natural gas service to rural Minnesotans that haven't had access to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chil Chilson, right? Um, next. Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, this morning. My name is Tim Thompson. I'm the CEO of Lake Region Electric Cooperative, headquartered in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota and also CEO of Lake Region Energy Services, our new natural gas subsidiary. Electric cooperatives were formed over 80 years ago to bring electricity to rural areas that did not have electricity because no one else would serve those rural areas. Today, our cooperative serves over 28,000 consumers across 5,700 miles of power lines. Today, natural gas service still does not exist for many rural areas and small towns, but co-op members and other rural communities in our area are requesting natural gas service. In 2017, we brought natural gas to the community of Deer Creek, population 324. We also brought natural gas to Parker's Prairie, population 999. In 2018, we brought natural gas to Dent, population 193, and Miltona, 408. As has been previously stated, it is very expensive to install the natural gas infrastructure in these rural areas. It takes a lot of miles of line of gas line to serve these small areas that don't have a lot of consumers. The tax relief that we're asking for will make it more economically feasible to extend natural gas lines out into these rural areas in small towns. Helping people save money on their energy bills by using natural gas has been a great experience uh, for our cooperative. We have helped schools save money. We have helped churches save money. We have helped Main Street. We have helped farmers 
and individuals in these rural areas. We estimate we save an average household about $400 per heating season. That is a lot of money uh, for these uh, families and makes a difference in their family budget. I urge you uh, to support the bill and help us help the people in these rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Do we have another testifier? Senator Johnson? Oh, yes, sir. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is David Blumseth. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. As I said before, my name is David Blumseth. I'm the general manager of Community Co-op in Lake Park, Minnesota. Community Co-op is a 111-year-old locally operated energy cooperative located in west central part of Minnesota. We entered into the natural gas business in 2015 and are currently serving six small rural communities. We are unique in the fact that besides a retailer of natural gas, we are also a large propane company, currently serving 5,500 propane customers and also serving around 500 fuel oil customers. We also operate four convenience stores and two shops and a hardware store. We are built on serving people in small rural communities. We are also proof that not just one energy source is needed to support rural Minnesota, but it takes a combination of them all to serve the people of Minnesota. The natural gas helps fill an unmet need for customers in providing a lower cost energy source for smaller rural towns and also agriculture. We have several ag customers that rely on natural gas as a cheaper alternative to dry their crops. This is very helpful to these customers during a very tough time economically in agriculture. A couple of years ago, during some heavy demand for propane during grain drying, there wasn't enough propane to supply everyone. This created a shortage that led to extreme high prices for a period of four weeks. Since that time, Minnesota has also lost the Koshin pipeline that was used to bring propane into the state from Canada. And now the northern part of the state is completely reliant on railroad terminals that also increases the cost of propane. This is where natural gas has been a good fit in rural Minnesota. It has created a reliable supply to help keep a balance during high demand seasons and has helped prevent shortages in propane during these times as well. The ability to utilize natural gas along with propane makes it more economical for people in rural Minnesota and helps create a positive impact on their quality of life and their economic well-being. The issue today is the economics work to bring natural gas to more of these small communities, but the cost of the property tax that we are charged gets passed on to the lower populations in these communities, and then it is not feasible. We at Community Co-op cannot expand our natural gas system further without this tax relief to more, make it more economically viable for our co-op members. I urge you to support this bill for the betterment of rural Minnesota. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Um, we have one more testifier. Yes, we do. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Jed Shaw, and I'm the mayor of the city of Walker. I'm going to stop in and see you next time I'm up there. Well, please do. <laughs> please do. Are you coming up for Yelp out? I go up there quite a bit during the summer. Huh? Well, uh, during the summer. Anyway, that's yes. off the record. Ah, well. <laughs> On this side. Um, small cities such as Walker often struggle to update outdated infrastructure. We have a limited tax base with close to half of our incorporated city held by the city, county, school, or state. Walker has a population of 962 with a median age of 49. Between 2015 and 2016, the population of Walker declined from 1,036 to 962, a 7.14 decrease, and its median household income declined, um, and its average is about $31,000 right now. I mention these statistics not to say poor us. We are an ambitious town and we have a thriving business district. I mention this in order to point out that any chance we may have to improve the financial situation of our businesses and citizens can have an outsized effect for us. The benefit has the potential to reach both the citizens of Walker as well as the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Passing this bill could be one of the largest single positive economic impacts possible for us. It is vitally important may also serve as a blueprint to help other small cities throughout our state. How often does one get the opportunity to pass legislation that is effectively beneficial for all parties involved? Please do vote in favor of this proposed bill. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, members, Senator Rest. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Johnson. Um, the uh, revenue estimate 
indicates um, very little impact for the next um, four years. And, um, and for now, since none of it has been built, there's, there's nothing. So um, just uh, re remind me, what kind of personal property are we actually talking about here? And what would be, um, and maybe this is a question for Mr. Silvio, what would be the estimated value of it, let's say, in the seventh year? That the abatement would would actually maybe have some uh, teeth in it. That's uh, uh, that's one question, and um, and <clears throat> I would like Mr. Sylvia to explain the the last sentence under the explanation of the bill uh, that says the net tax capacity for the prop for the property, or, or maybe this is uh, I think this is for you will still be included in the in commercial industrial tax capacity used to cal calculate the state general levy tax rate. And my question is, if, if I understand that correctly, it would be whatever um, value is there um, is still going to be taxed, just not by this group. And so... Uh, that net tax capacity that will then go into the general levy is going to be paid, uh, that particular one is going to be paid by um, all the other commercial industrial properties. Um, is that right, or do, am I confusing something? Senator there? Johnson, you want to take the first crack, or Mr. Sylvia? Mr. Sylvia, go ahead. I saw a look in your eye, Senator Johnson. So. Was, was it hope, hopelessness, or, or what are you saying? Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sylvia, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rest, um, most personal property in, in the state is not taxed, but uh, there are certain types of personal property that, that is taxed, and, and some of that is the electric, our personal property of electric uh, generating, transmission, um, distribution system, pipeline. So that's the personal property that we're talking about in this bill. So this bill would, would abate the personal property tax paid uh, subject to the state general tax paid by these utility properties. Uh, in terms of the reference in the revenue estimate to the, the tax capacity, um, the way the bill is structured that the, the personal property that would be subject to the tax would still be included when the Department of Revenue calculates the tax rate that's used to um, calculate the the tax liability for these properties for the tax, the state general tax, but then that that tax that's collected by the county is the county that's abating that tax. So it's not um, spread necessarily in other types of property. The tax would be collected, essentially returned back. It's just that that property is still calculated uh, when figuring out the rate that would apply for all personal property property across the street. And, state. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rest. Um, Mr. Sylvia, or uh, Senator Johnson, why is why is that particular mechanism a good idea? Senator Johnson? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't oppose the bill, please understand. Sure, me. no, I think those are uh, great questions, Senator Rest. Uh, for the sole purpose uh, of this bill is simply to make sure that we lower that capital cost to make the feasibility of these projects. Now, if that's requiring, like Mr. Silva said, um, taking that uh, at the county level with the personal property, um, Right now, that seems to really close the gap and make these projects possible. Um, so that looks like the most clean way of doing this uh, and making sure that we can get those projects out to Walker and Cook County and other areas throughout the state. Senator Rest, any follow-up? Just was just curious. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, any members, any other questions? Uh, Yes, Senator Sanjay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just I have a curiosity question too. Uh, as as we seek to abate this tax, uh, I know in many communities, and I'm I'm not sure about the smaller ones that are just introducing natural gas into their communities, but uh, in in many of the larger communities, mine included, uh, there's a there's a franchise uh, fee on natural gas companies that, frankly, just one company that that serves the community and it's fairly substantial. Do do communities that would be served 
uh, say, for instance, under this program going forward, would we expect them to charge these gas companies natural or franchise fees just for the right to serve those communities? Or is, is that the general practice with all gas companies? Senator Johnson, you'll defer. I'll defer that to. Please state your name again. Thank David you. Blumseth with Community Co op. Um, the communities we serve, none of them charge a franchise fee because it gets to be just a, a pass through. Yes, it would be charged to us, but ultimately it's, it's also put on their bill as a franchise fee. And so when we went to all the communities, we actually said we would not do the projects in these communities if they charged a franchise fee because we're not wanting to be a new tax mechanism on the people of that community. And that's all it would end up being. And they're trying to serve the members of people of their community. There was no justification of why to do a franchise fee because it doesn't cost us anything. It actually falls back on the customer. So. All right, with that, uh, Senator Johnson, any final comments regarding this proposal? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I think we've said enough here. I uh, appreciate the time and uh, your support on this in the past, and uh, any questions that come up will be more than, more than happy to answer. Thank you very much. With that, Senate file, Senate file 318 is held over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. And next up is uh, Senate File 383. That's me. Yeah. And Senator Senjum will take over. Good morning, uh, Senator Chamberlain. Welcome to your committee. Uh, it's good to see you there. Uh, Senate File 383, uh, Senator Chamberlain, Indian Tribal Land Property Tax Exemption Expansion for Pharmacies. I think this was before us last year, as I recall. Uh, and you have an amendment, Senator Chamberlain? Would you like to get the bill yeah, in order? I have, a, I have the A1 amendment. Okay, we all have the A1 amendment. Uh, Without objection, we'll attach that. Uh, all, let, let me just say, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. And the amendment is uh, on your bill, Senator Chamberlain. You want to proceed? Uh, I, the amendment itself, I believe, uh, simply clarifies the language a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the exact language of last year, but certainly clarifies the language from what we had introduced this year. Uh, I'll have Mr. LeBeau speak to this. It's pretty straightforward and simple. It's a uh, pharmacy uh, owned by an Indian tribe, and it's located in Minneapolis. And practice is that we do not, uh, they're exempt from the, these taxes. So we're just uh, clarifying this for this particular pharmacy in Minneapolis. With that, I'll give it over to Mr. LeBeau. Mr. LeBeau, welcome to the committee. You introduce yourself and uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Reed LeBeau on behalf of the Fond du Lac Band. I want to thank uh, Chairman Senator Chamberlain uh, for again bringing this. Uh, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, this provision was included in the tax bill and was acted upon favorably by this committee last session. Uh, sadly, it was uh, part of the larger package that was vetoed uh, by the former governor, and we appreciate uh, the chairman and uh, the um, other members, Senator Hayden, uh, signing on to this bill, and uh, um, appreciate your uh, favorable uh, action on it again this year. Thank you. Uh, questions of the committee? Senator so, Chamberlain, I have one, uh, and maybe it's more for staff. Uh, does the law define what a pharmacy is? Pharmacies now are a lot of things. Uh, obviously, the presumption is they sell drugs, but they also sell virtually anything. And the question really is, is anything within this building then, as proposed, exempt from sales tax? That's a, a Senator, Mr. Chair, that's a good question. And right, even the one, one in Walker we go into all the time, sells, you know, cards and yeah. fly swatters and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I'll defer to Ms. Pollock or Mr. Sylvia if we have a definition for pharmacies. 
Mr. Chair, um, Senator Senjum, I'm not I'm not aware of a, a, a definition of pharmacy in, in the property tax statutes. There must be one in <coughs> other statutes that could be referenced. It's not um, stated specifically here in the bill. Um, I know the the bill is written you know, specifically for one in in mind, but um, it might be a good idea if we could reference another definition of a pharmacy to further limit this exemption. Okay. Uh. Well, we won't hold the build up, Senator Chairman. Uh, uh, it, maybe something to think about going forward. Mr. Chair, it's a good question. We'll we'll look it up. I hope sure. there is a definition. If not, we'll well, we'll make one. My right, pardon? Senator Rest. Well, Senator Senator Rest. I'm sorry. Um, I was just cur again curious. <clears throat> um, why is it just a 10 year exemption, which would then in a sense, it just makes it um, uh, with the sunset. Is there a reason for that, or just happened? Uh, uh, Senator, uh, Mr. LeBeau, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Rest, uh, we were uh, basing this off of a tax exemption that went into effect, I believe, four years ago for a different tribal property located on Franklin Avenue. And I believe at that time, it was the will of the committee and then Chairman uh, Scoy that all the property tax exemptions have a sunset put in them so that they were re reviewed every so often. And so that's why you see that sunset in this case. So, Mr. Chairman, so it's, rest. Um, it's likely um, if it remains a going business that 10 years from now you would uh, come back and ask for it to be um, extended. I mean, just as a matter of course, would that Mr. be Lebeau? correct? Mr. Chairman, send a rest. I, I believe that would okay. probably So there's be no particular reason for the 10 years other than the principle of having a sunset. Mr. Chairman, send her yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else on Senate file 383? Okay. If not, Senate file 383 is, uh, as amended, is held over for a possible inclusion. And we move forward then to Senate File 319. Senator Chamberlain, uh, this is also a bill for uh, the, on which you have a proposed amendment dealing with uh, medical cannabis and so on and so forth. Do you want to offer your amendment? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I have the A1 amendment. Okay, we have the A1 amendment. Uh, a brief explanation, Senator Chamberlain. Uh, I believe this simply adds AMT. We have individual. There's uh, a couple sections. One is individual income tax subtraction. One is uh, corporate income and franchise tax subtraction. The other is AMT. That is correct. We added, you added that in, correct, Ms. Pollock? Um, uh, Mr. Pollock. Chair, Senator Chamberlain, yes. The amendment um, includes the subtraction in the calculation of AMT. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions on the amendment? If not, all in favor say aye. Mm -hmm. I opposed uh, nay, and the amendment is on your bill. Senator Chamberlain, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, this bill was in last year's omnibus bill. It's the same except for the amendment, including EMT. Basically, what we have here is, as you're aware, all other businesses have certain sub deductions from their income to get to taxable income. And those deductions include cost of goods sold, and then other expenses such like such as rent and wages and compensation, things like that. Uh, but federal law has uh, has prohibited companies like this who deal in or manufacture these sorts of uh, uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals that are still illegal at the federal level. They, ex they prohibit them from subtracting certain expenses. They allow cost of goods sold expenses to be subtracted, but nothing else. They do not allow normal and reoccurring business expenses to be subtracted from their income to get the taxable income, uh, like other companies do. So all we're doing here is saying that we're going to treat this. We made medical can cannabis legal in the state of Minnesota, so we believe that the the businesses that manufacture and produce the medical cannabis should be treated like other businesses in Minnesota and be allowed to subtract, as a tax, uh, related to tax, be allowed to subtract those normal and reoccurring business expenses from uh, their income to get the taxable income. So we just want to treat them like other businesses in the state of Minnesota. Uh, 
That's number one. Align it, simplify it. It's fair. The second piece is uh, the incidental, the indirect or direct impact of uh, not allowing these normal and reoccurring subtractions is that it increases the cost to the consumer, which is the patient. Uh, so the patient right now, Minnesota Insurance does not cover uh, uh, prescription or prescribed medical cannabis because it does not cover that. The cost for this medical cannabis, when prescribed by a physician, is incurred by the patient. They pay the, they pay the full freight. So what this also does is increases the cost to those patients, unnecessarily increases the cost of those patients. So uh, by doing this, we simplify it for the companies and the businesses, treat them like other businesses and companies. Secondly, and directly lower the cost of medical cannabis for those uh, patients who have been prescribed medical cannabis. So that's the explanation of the bill. With that, I'll turn it over to the two testifiers. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, introduce yourself for the committee, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to offer this testimony. My name is Amber Shimpa, and I am the Chief Financial Officer of Minnesota Medical Solutions. We are one of the two medical cannabis manufacturers in the state of Minnesota. Uh, my professional background is in banking, and I have been involved in all financial matters uh, for MinMed, including, including taxation and audits since its inception. Minnesota Medical Solutions is proud to see the Minnesota medical cannabis program continue to grow, and we are very encouraged by the number of chronic pain patients who can reduce or discontinue use of dangerous and addictive opioid medications by switching to cannabis-based medications. But cost remains a top concern uh, relayed by our patients across the state, and for many Minnesotans, our medications simply are too expensive despite our best efforts to make them more affordable through competitive, compassionate discounts and loyalty programs. The reasons for the high costs are many, including the fact that health insurance does not cover the cost of medical cannabis. Therefore, all patients must cover the full cost of these products out of pocket. Moreover, while Minnesota's medical cannabis program is growing, the relatively low number of enrolled patients makes it difficult for operators to achieve economies of scale in production. It should be noted that while the medical cannabis manufacturers are, are finally approaching break-even, both have su suffered substantial cumulative losses since inception. Uh, but there's another layer to the cost equation, which is why we're here today, the very unusual tax treatment of medical cannabis manufacturers in Minnesota. IRC Section 280E, a federal tax provision, prevents cannabis companies from deducting expenses from their income, except those considered for cost of goods sold. Thus, we are not able to deduct many of the standard business expenses that those in every other industry can, like rent, marketing, and certain payroll expenses. The Minnesota tax code mandates the same exclusion, and this dramatically drives up our combined state and federal taxation rates. In fact, our effective tax rate is over 100%. Let me repeat that. It is over 100%. Uh, this is by far the highest tax rate that any Minnesota corporation pays, and enough to cause just about any business to shut its doors. As can be expected, we unfortunately are forced to pass some of these exorbitant costs of taxes onto our patients, making Minnesota's medical cannabis prices some of the highest in the nation. And while the Minnesota legislator cannot change federal state Federal tax law, it does have the authority to amend state tax law. We are therefore hopeful that a relatively straightforward change in Minnesota law will allow us to deduct standard business expenses from our Minnesota state corporate taxes, resulting in substantial savings for the company. And simply put, savings on the tax bill would translate to savings for our patients. And to be clear, we are not asking for special treatment, just standard treatment as a state-licensed legal business operating in the state of Minnesota. We are not asking you to set a precedent here of being the first state to enact tax fairness for state medical cannabis businesses. Other states that allow for the medicinal use of cannabis have taken this step, and we are hopeful that as more states tackle this issue, there will eventually be change to the federal tax code as well. And I'd like to make one additional comment here this morning. Medical cannabis can be a part of the solution to opioids. Chronic pain was added as a qualifying condition in August of 2016. 
And since then, we have served thousands of pain patients from all across the state seeking an alternative to the addictive and dangerous opioids they are using. And pain patients are very aware of the risk they take by using these highly addictive medications, but they often had no alternatives until now. As I said earlier, we are encouraged by the number of chronic pain patients who have come to MinMed seeking an opioid alternative. About two-thirds of our pain patients have either reduced their opioid medication using significant use significantly or have stopped altogether. Passage of this legislation would help us reduce costs for our patients and would be a major step forward in addressing the scourge of opioid addiction. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Shimpa, is that it? Yes. Close? Okay. Uh, Mr. Parnell, you want to testify? Good member. Welcome, uh, good morning, members. Welcome, to McMitty, and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Corey Parnell. I am CEO of Beckerman, Grafstrom, and Mayer, which is a local CPA firm. Um, thank you for allowing me to take this time to testify. And uh, first of all, I became involved with the organization once I met one of the um, patients. Uh, it was a 12-year-old girl that uh, was uh, had epilepsy seizures, and through that medication, it was life-changing. So that's how I and our firm got involved with this organization. And then one thing I'd, I'd like to share is the two, federal 280E tax law, how that got created was in 1981, the IRS lost a court case to a drug dealer in which uh, the drug dealer was allowed to deduct his uh, home office expense, his car travel expenses. So then Congress, the following year in 1982, created a statute, 280E, which disallowed um, deductions other than cost of goods sold. Um, so that, that's the federal tax law that is we're dealing with at this time. And um, so in particular, to give an example, if Target was subject to 280E law, they would actually pay income tax on their cost of goods sold. So any expenditures like the store operating expenses, the employees in the store, the general administrative expenses are all non-deductible. So that's all we're asking for is, is uh, to have the state tax statute align with the state um, uh, licensing of legal medical cannabis organizations. So they're allowed to be able to deduct those expenses just like a target organization. And again, as Amber or Ms. Shimpa testified, um, uh, that should help in regards of in attempting to get the cost of the product more reasonable. Thank you for your time this morning. Questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Chamberlain, you want to wrap it up? Uh, not much more to say. Uh, again, was last year's bill very reasonable, very, very fair. Um, uh, uh, legislation to bring them into align with other companies with that uh, uh, laid over. Thank okay, you. so Senate file uh, 319, uh, Senator Chamberlain dealing with medical cannabis manufacturers is amend as amended, is uh, held over for possible inclusion. And with that, Senator Chamberlain, do you want to announce uh, tomorrow's date? Yeah, we have, um, yes, members, we do have hearings tomorrow and Thursday. So, okay. We'll be With here that, tomorrow. The uh, tax well. committee is adjourned until 8:30 tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs>